Welcome to another session from Green World Group. Um, today's topic is about first aid, CPR, and AD. Um, this is again a very short preview of uh, what we will be pre presenting you to, uh, with a full-fledged training, uh, if you choose to believe, uh, if you choose to uh, take from us. Um, now, um, about CPR, about first aid, um, even after me providing this course to you, you do not become a medical professional. Uh, professional, okay? Uh, me providing this course does not make me a medical professional. I, I don't become a doctor. Um, but what is the point of this course then? Well, first aid is a basic necessity uh, to every human being, I believe. And uh, everyone should have the knowledge to provide basic first aid. For what purpose? To preserve, or sorry, to keep a person alive just for two things to occur. Either you get to the hospital or the ambulance comes to you, either or, right? So we need to take these steps as quickly as possible and as competently as possible to keep that person alive and not create as many problems uh, or not create secondary problems. We will explain this in much more detail, but let's go into this course as quickly as we can. So what is a first aid? Well, it's the first help that you would provide to aid someone in case of sickness, injury, um, or um, close to fatality, so you can say, right? So <clears throat> there are essentials to this uh, that we will discuss in much more detail, but let me get to the major three purposes of providing first aid. First purpose is to preserve life, to keep that life, uh, keep that life, um, well, keep that person alive as long enough to, again, two things to happen. Either you get that person to the uh, hospital or the ambulance comes to you. Second purpose of the first aid is to prevent secondary complications, meaning you stay at the problem at hand and do not create another one, do not create another one, do not create another one. One of the most simplest way I can explain this to you is that the first thing you see when you open the first aid kit should be, or first thing you should uh, use, is the medical gloves. The medical gloves saves both of us, the victim as well as you uh, applying the first aid. Well, we never have the time um, to stop what we're doing and then, uh, or we never have the time in case of an emergency to tell the individual that, okay, uh, hold on a second, I have to go wash my hands and come real quickly, uh, come back real quick. Um, it's, it's not possible. Uh, but we shouldn't waste our time doing that. So the first thing we do is put on the gloves because our hands might have a lot of bacteria or germs or uh, disease, uh, well, bacteria that can infect the individual's wound. But not only that, we must protect ourselves from uh, bloodborne pathogens that uh, can be transmitted from, uh, from the victim, uh, the bleeding victim. So it goes both ways. Again, we stay at the problem at hand and we don't create more complications uh, along the way. Then comes the third uh, purpose of the first aid kit, is to promote speedy recovery. Again, our human body is, um, is, is beautiful, uh, but as soon as we get hurt, if we, uh, if we take care of it, if we apply, uh, if we sanitize it, if we um, uh, cover it up, if we bandage it, we uh, start the healing process because our human body will regenerate uh, as quickly as it's um, um, as we apply uh, first aid properly, right? So here are the three major purposes: preserve life, prevent secondary complications, and third, promote speedy recovery, right? So. Um, Universally, uh, usually people would hesitate helping others because of um, legal reasons. People would say that, oh, if I couldn't uh, save this person, then uh, and, uh, and while helping him, um, uh, he uh, passes away, then uh, I will be legally uh, obliged to, uh, to be sued. But there is a good Samaritan law that is universally practiced, which is generally that uh, if you are doing it for good intention, if you were trying to help an individual or you were trying to assist uh, in the, uh, saving that person's life, um, according to the good Samaritan law, you will be pardoned, right? Despite you win, uh, despite you um, save that individual or, or that person 
uh, is not uh, able to be saved. But our mental consciousness would always be um, that what if what if we tried, right? So for those reasons, we must always try helping people as much as we can right? for Good Samaritan reasons. Now, universal do's and universal don'ts. I want to talk about just the don'ts uh, here uh, because right now during the pandemic, uh, everyone is wearing masks. Um, but the universal don'ts, um, first of all, uh, we must never prescribe anyone medicine because we're not doctors, unless you are a doctor and you can prescribe someone medicine. Uh, that's a different story. But not prescribing any medicine um, because we don't know. Uh, but maybe this uh, medicine might be uh, might have side effects to every ind any individual uh, because of their pre-existing uh, conditions. Right? Uh, again, a doctor studies an individual, takes a case, um, and then he prescribes medicine that is suitable to that individual. Um, but not only that, uh, do not ever put prescribed medicine in a first aid kit. It shouldn't be belonging in there. Why? Because a first aid kit is general, it's for everyone. There should be no edible uh, medicine in there except one, um, which is aspirin. And why aspirin is there? Well, uh, for that, uh, please make sure you take our uh, full classes for a first aid uh, provided by uh, Green World. And the second thing that you should never do uh, is declare death. What happens with that is, um, let me give you a scenario. Uh, if someone's heart stopped beating uh, and he's collapsed on the floor and uh, you run up to him um, and you stand there and say, oh, he's no more. Now, if anyone else competent enough is gonna come towards uh, this uh, incident um, and if you say he's no more, uh, that person gives up before he even tries, right? So we don't have the right to declare death. Even when paramedics would arrive or doctors arrived, they would never uh, just plain out say, oh, he's no more. They would try, they would try. While they load him into the ambulance, they'll be providing him CPR and constantly trying to revive him. Uh, even when they get to the hospital, they will do as many things as possible to keep this person uh, from dying. Um, but after trying everything, and if they do fail, uh, then they will declare uh, that person to be dead. But we don't have the right to say that. Our job is just to try as much as we can because sometimes it will take um, 20 to 30 cycles of CPR to revive someone. Sometimes it will take maybe a one, two, or maybe five. But we should not give up. We should keep trying, right? So what should be our action plan? Our action plan consists of five major things. Uh, first, very first thing is call for help. Call for backup. You must call for backup, understand the situation, what it is, uh, so that it's easy for you to communicate that uh, to uh, the emergency units on the call. Uh, but you must call for backup because you could be there all day and nobody will come, nobody would know, right? So very first thing. And this is one of the major steps. Even if you are bedazzled uh, and you are shell-shocked uh, of the magnitude of the incident that is happening there, uh, in front of you um, and you feel helpless, well, the first thing you should do, or, the, or sometimes in this, in most cases, the only thing you could do is call for help. So you must call for backup. Then calmly take charge. Because if you are not calm, then you spread panic, right? Again, panic uh, is something that we are trying to eliminate as much as possible. Um, so calmly take charge. Okay. Then check the scene and casualties. There could be many other casualties. There could be still uh, a hazardous situation developing. Uh, it could be a hazardous atmosphere. It could be a, uh, it could be uh, more things that are happening. Uh, but you must check the scene. Is it even safe for you to go in? Maybe uh, spread people out. Uh, leave um, get people away from the uh, scene of the of the incident. Uh, and look for casualties. Um, who else uh, is hurt? How many people you have, uh, you would need to provide uh, first aid for or um, to take care of, right? And then carefully apply first aid. Now, the reason why it's saying, uh, we're saying carefully apply first aid is because um, first aid 
kit, so to say. It's, it's, it's a box, right? Uh, all the essentials are in there. Now, if we act uh, very harshly or we hurry or we, um, uh, we start running, uh, which would also be very panicky, uh, what we do is that we might accidentally release the contents all over the place, right? So now it's in a box so that it stays safe, clean, and sanitized. But once we uh, harshly open it or, um, or everything, uh, all the contents uh, spread across the floor or wherever, um, it could be easily contaminated, right? So now it's no good to anybody, right? And then the last, last final thing is communicate the status and write a report. Well, this is two parts. First, communicate the status. To whom? Where? Well, if you have done the very first thing, which is call for help, well, by the time you get to this fifth um, action, um, it would uh, you'll see results, meaning the ambulance might be arriving at this point. So, and if they catch you doing CPR, it's not like they're gonna stop, or if you hear the sirens uh, coming and you, you think, okay, everything's fine, I should stop. No, no, uh, you should keep continuing because we should keep trying. But when they will arrive, they will see you doing CPR if you're doing it adequately, uh, they will start setting up their AED and, uh, and then ask you in that process. Um, what happened, how it happened. Uh, and you need to uh, deliver that, all that information very uh, clearly uh, and very descriptively of whatever you've seen, whatever you've accumulated uh, from that uh, incident so that they can then decide how to uh, proceed and uh, what they should be doing and check out uh, things that you've already done so that they get a clearer picture, right? Then comes the uh, the writer report. Now, when everything is said and done and they've loaded the, the person into uh, the ambulance and they're taking him to the hospital, um, whatnot, uh, well, then uh, either your organization or your um, or the uh, local police will, uh, will pull you to the side and uh, ask you for a report. Now, it's done right there and then. Why? Because of the, um, the authenticity, uh, the, um, the clear clear clarity of it. Because um, whatever you would say there, um, you wouldn't have time to think, but instead you'd be saying everything truthfully. And uh, you remember everything also. So, that, so they want to capture um, uh, as accurate of information as possible uh, so that they can write all of that down or you can write all of that down and turn in the report. So eyewitness report to say uh, what happened, how it happened, what did you do and, uh, and how did it proceed, right? So it clears you, and um, it also gives them a better case study to uh, to prevent that from happening ever again, or file that case, so to say. Well, so these were your five action plans. Now, what is the skills uh, that a first aider should possess? Well, he should be a good observer. Obviously, he's seen something happen. He uh, that caught his eye, or an incident that happened. So he's observed uh, that uh, this has happened. Then he should talk to the individual because it's very important to get consent to talk to an individual uh, who is a victim, who has just fallen onto the floor, um, maybe uh, to figure out what the signs, what the symptoms are, uh, and look for signs and symptoms uh, in that speech pattern. Uh, but most importantly, get the consent and give that comfort uh, to that individual of who you are, what you can do, and how you are going to help them. Right. Uh, then comes the touch. Um, you must touch the individual to see if there's a heartbeat, to see uh, what those injuries are. Obviously, if you see him bleeding, then you know that there is a uh, there's a there's an external bleeding uh, occurring. Right. But uh, the touch part really comes to, towards uh, the heartbeat. Right. Uh, then feel feel the heartbeat if you can, um, um, but also feel the breath. Uh, feel the breath on uh, on the outside of your fingers uh, by putting it underneath his uh, his nostrils, um, right? Um, but listen, uh, and you can also apply your ear directly to this person's chest to see uh, if to hear uh, if this person has a heartbeat, or even the faintest, right? Um, and that's one of the best ways to figure out if the person is beating, if it's heart beating, because to be honest, in a situation. Uh, in a very serious situation, obviously, you yourself, your heart, uh, yourself, um, uh, will be beating uh, much faster than it usually would uh, because of it, uh, the magnitude of the incident um, and the, uh, the, the responsibility that you will have uh, to save this individual's life. Um, so um, the listening uh, really helps when you can apply your ear directly to uh, the person's chest. 
uh, to hear the heartbeat without, with eliminating all other uh, uh, misunderstandings or, or complications, right? And then provide. So once you've assessed uh, the situation, uh, you can now determine either uh, you need to pro uh, provide this person with CPR or you need to provide this person with uh, first aid measures, right? But most importantly, throughout this whole process, a first aider must build trust. Uh, and it starts from the very beginning, from, from the talking part, um, that he must introduce himself. He must get the consent uh, if he is, if that individual, uh, if the victim is uh, conscious. Uh, but he must build trust throughout the whole process. Now, a simple way to explain this is uh, if someone, let's say, is bleeding out uh, and he's on the floor and you stand above him and say, oh, I don't think you're going to make it. Well, that's not really helpful. Even if he was going to make it, now that you really disheartened him. But um, building trust throughout the way by providing this person with verbal comfort uh, and keeping this person away from, um, from closing his eyes or so to say, staying away from the light. Um, but uh, you must provide this person with that sense of comfort that who you are, what you can do. Uh, you have notified uh, the ambulance, they are on their way, uh, just hang in there. These are great words. These are, um, these are very comforting words um, and uh, helping this individual out through this time because when a person is on that floor, um, his life is literally flashing by him. Uh, every past deed he's done or every unfinished thing that uh, he's uh, is yet to finish in his life, uh, everything that's pending in his life, uh, is going to be flashing by him, his loved ones and so on. And uh, you would have to give him that motivation or distraction, so to say, uh, to give him that support. Now, let's get into uh, CPR. Um, there are a lot of uh, phrases um, out there uh, that describe CPR, but I'm gonna go with uh, just the, uh, the ABC or uh, the CAB here, which is uh, three major things when you were talking about CPR. Um, compressions, airway, and breath. Now, for compressions, uh, we've come a long way uh, to what we used to do and what we are doing now. Uh, we had different hand formations. We had this, we had this, or you may, <laughs> some people would, uh, uh, go in for the, the punches. Uh, but uh, what we've now come to is uh, the simple hand formation of applying our fingers uh, in, this, in this format. Uh, the reason why this is so helpful is because um, if you notice your palm, uh, well, there's a, there's a high point, there's a very deep point, and then there's a higher point. So in order to even the surface out, we use the other, hand, uh, the other fingers that apply in this format to create a flatter surface. It's flat enough right, uh, to apply the proper amount of compression and ap apply the proper amount of pressure required to jumpstart that heart. Um, then comes the, uh, the airway. The airway um, needs to be open when, before we provide that mouth to mouth breath. Um, now, in our throats or in our necks, um, there are two major uh, ways. Um, one, we eat food, uh, it goes into our, uh, through that uh, valve, it goes into, um, into our stomach. Uh, then we're constantly breathing, so there's another valve that goes into our lungs, right? Now, if the only way we can open our airway is by uh, tilting our head uh, backwards, right? Um, what that allows to happen is that it closes the, um, the uh, stomach uh, valve and um, it opens up the air valve, um, which allows the oxygen that you are providing um, to him uh, going into the right place, into our lungs, not into our stomach. Because if it goes into our stomach, uh, we can have secondary complications such as uh, uh, if unprocessed food can come right back into the throat or um, could create more problems such as choking uh, into the victim. Then comes the breath. Uh, we should be providing an individual with two breaths. Um, um, this is very important. Why? Because uh, we have our jump starting the heart by compressions, uh, forcefully applying that, but we're also applying fresh oxygen uh, forcefully into the lungs, um, which is very important. Right? Again, a uh, more practical aspect of this, uh, feel free to join um, 
one of our sessions uh, led by uh, by me, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, we would be able to provide you with more details uh, thanks to Green World Group. Now, explaining in more details of how the hand formation should be in terms of opening the airways. Uh, as you can see, those two valves right there, one from the mouth and one from the uh, nostrils. Right? Uh, you must apply gently the uh, two fingers to the chin bone right? and the head uh, onto the uh, forehead of the individual and try leaning it. The reason why we're saying the chin bone because it's much more solid and if you go anything lower you could be pushing uh, the, the tongue um, in an uncomfortable position. All right. So there are different ways to check breathing. We can either put our ears, uh, we can feel the breath sometimes onto our faces. Uh, we can um, feel it on our hands. Uh, we can place a hand onto the chest to feel a heartbeat. Uh, but one of the best ways to uh, to feel a heartbeat is by putting the ear right to the uh, source, which is the heart, to the chest. Now, CPR. I've been saying CPR all this time. Uh, what is CPR? CPR is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Right? Um, it is uh, one of the quickest ways uh, that any individual can provide uh, to a person whose heart has stopped. Uh, to keep that person um, from uh, passing away. Right? Now, it's very important uh, that we must provide this as quickly as possible because before uh, the blood uh, dries up, um, through lack of movement, lack of circulation of oxygen as well as blood in the air. All right, so yeah. So when should we provide CPR? Well, we should provide CPR whenever we have uh, identified uh, that the individual, the victim, uh, does not have any vitals. Uh, but we should never provide CPR to an individual that has uh, vitals. So if the person's heart is beating, uh, then CPR is not your way to go. It will create more problems. Even while we are training, we will use dummies uh, to show uh, exactly how CPR is done, but we will never use actual volunteer. Why? Because it will create more problems. Uh, obviously, uh, we can stop a heart uh, by applying constant pressure uh, to the heart itself. We'll skip uh, a couple of beats. So in more detail, we will also be providing how to do CPR to infants as well as uh, to toddlers. Uh, and not only that, but also uh, babies uh, and uh, children from the ages of uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, to the ages till um, till 10 to 15, 10 to uh, 11. So when do we stop CPR? When do we stop providing CPR? How do we know? Well, uh, we should stop C applying CPR when help arrives, not when you start hearing the sirens, but uh, when they when the paramedics come and they uh, set up their uh, their AEDs and uh, their support and they start asking you questions uh, and they'll take over from you. So that's stopping CPR from you, but not for them. They will keep continuing. Um, when you're exhausted, uh, that doesn't mean you should give up, but um, if you have people available, you could be, and if you know that, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that you would need help, um, which you should always. Um, so you can train people on the spot saying that, hey, watch me very carefully. Uh, or you can split the load uh, with that individual saying that, okay, I will do the compressions and you can do the breaths or I, or we can switch uh, back and forth uh, to keep this going. Then third, when life appears, um, of course, uh, you don't need CPR anymore. If you've jump started the heart, you've resuscitated a person uh, back to life. Um, you you would then require uh, you would then be required to put this person into a uh, into a recovery position, right? Uh, which I will also talk about. And then lastly is when you're when it's pronounced dead. Obviously, we don't have the right to pronounce anyone dead. Uh, but if the paramedics uh, have pronounced someone dead or the doctors pronounce someone dead, then uh, uh, we must respect that call because they didn't just say it. they've uh, tried everything and. Uh, after trying everything, um, was it successful? Uh, nuts. They will declare that individual. But we often, uh, because maybe it could be someone or one of our loved ones uh, that we would be entitled to keep trying. 
So we must provide, we must not provide CPR to an individual who's just gone unconscious and he is breathing um, and uh, there is a heartbeat. So if a person is not breathing and uh, he is unconscious, then yes, we would be providing someone with CPR. Um, but once we have revived that individual, we must place him into a recovery position. Exactly how that is done, uh, we can be explaining that in the to the sessions. Just to give you an exact um, look of what the, the recovery position is. Yeah. Right. Now, um, the AED, the Automated External Defibrillator, this is one of the best piece of tech that uh, we have ever, mankind has ever created uh, to save people's lives, uh, my personal opinion. But this is a very smart piece of tech. Um, first of all, it's automated, meaning uh, it speaks to you. It tells you what to do. Okay. Uh, then comes the external part, uh, the defibrillator part, sorry. Um, it will, first of all, uh, there are pads um, that are for different uh, body types. Uh, so if it's a child, uh, uh, the pad will have an image of where to place it. Um, so it's very self-explanatory. Uh, then, or onto an individual, place those pads exactly where the image says, uh, because these pads have a sensor uh, that connects to the device itself and analyzes the body. Um, it analyzes the body in terms of understanding how big it is, how, uh, how much charge it should emit uh, to resuscitate this person. Uh, right. So. Um, and it will speak to you throughout the whole process, um, telling you what should you do and, uh, and how you should be doing it. So even after providing the AED, uh, and once it's charged fully um, and it emits that, um, that shock, um, it is very important that uh, we are not in contact with this. Uh, this piece of tech is so smart that it will identify that if we are uh, touching or if we are in contact with the individual, um, the, the victim, uh, it will pick up our heartbeat and say that there is life. So we should not have any contact with, uh, uh, well, if we're providing CPR and we've applied uh, the pads, uh, we should stop CPR, uh, let the machine, um, let the AED analyze the body uh, and charge up accordingly. And uh, once it's ready, it will tell you to uh, press the button to emit the charge. Uh, and we remind you not to have any contact uh, with the individual for that period. Uh, but once it's done and that person is still not alive, uh, it will also tell you to continue with CPR and how many cycles you must provide. Oh, um, how many, what, um, a CPR consists of um, 30 compressions and two breaths. That is one cycle of CPR, by the way. Um, so uh, with that, and if, uh, again, this device is quite smart and, um, once there is a heartbeat, even the faintest of heartbeats, um, this machine will tell you to stop uh, and it will tell you that there is life. And then you can uh, place that person into a recovery position. So what it is in the first aid kit? Well, you have a whole lot of things. Uh, three major um, tools that you have uh, is scissors, tweezers, right? Um, and uh, what was the third one? Yeah. So we have scissors, we have tweezers, right? Um, and then, sorry, two, uh, mistaken. So we have um, alcohol swabs in there. We have different types of bandages for different uh, purposes. Um, then uh, the only edible medicine that we can keep uh, in the first aid kit is the aspirin. And aspirin is only there for heart, uh, heart attack patients. So individuals who would uh, be going through a heart attack uh, we should be providing that person with uh, an aspirin. But it's not just uh, take an aspirin with water. Uh, no, um, it has to be taken without water. Um, and uh, the victim must bite it, chew at it, uh, and then swallow it. So it's not just uh, an immediate swallow, but he must break it up and swallow it. What an aspirin does is that it uh, it's a blood thinner. Um, and a heart attack occurs due to a blockage. Um, due to uh, cholesterol being forming uh, next to or inside uh, in a major artery, which uh, could disperse uh, 
sorry, it won't disperse. But um, what happens is that once you uh, once you take the aspirin, it uh, thins the blood so that the uh, the blood will find its own uh, little smallest of gaps and it will keep the circulation going. Again, this is a very temporary solution uh, to just keep this person alive till either two things happen: you get to the hospital or the ambulance comes to you. All right. So again, uh, when you take this course with us, uh, it will be much more detailed, of course. We will be talking about major things in more detail about heart attack patients, strokes, um, um, heat strokes, uh, exhaustion. Um, uh, not only that, uh, we'll talk about cuts, um, internal bleeding, uh, spinal cord injuries, uh, certain sicknesses, uh, even um, contagious diseases. Um, and we talk about a lot more, uh, and plus uh, nosebleeds as well, um, and so on. Um, so these are very essential things that uh, I believe each and every individual must uh, uh, have knowledge of, um, and so that they can take care of themselves as well as the loved ones around them. But not only just limited to that, but everyone around them. So with that, uh, thank you very much. I'm Fasiya Shwak Emin, and uh, this is Green World Group. Thank you very much. Take care.